King Zahir's cousin, Muhammad Dawood, had been planning a coup for a number of years. When the time came, precision was the key. All top civilian and military officials were to be arrested at exactly the same time, minutes after all telephone lines had been cut. Hey guys, welcome back to Off the Cuff History. I'm here with Yuri again. He's going to be doing a deeper dive into the Tsar Revolution of 1978. Last time we didn't give as many details and this time, Yuri, what are we going to get? We're going to get a semi-deep dive due to time constraints, but let's hope we can flesh it out a little bit better. Because I, as you've seen by the corrections in the last episode, happen to have made a couple of misstatements and that is not very good. So It's okay, we corrected it with the captions. We corrected it with the captions, but I'd rather correct it with my words because this is history and it's important to get things right. Otherwise, you know, it's true. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the Sao Revolution, but not just the Sao Revolution. I'd like to put this in a bigger context of what the political, uh, basically, situation was in Afghanistan leading up to the, well, it's not exaggerating to call it the disastrous calamity tragedy that was the uh, Soviet-Afghan war for too many people involved. So, uh, to start it off, I just want to give a bit of like a history of Afghanistan um, before, even like before, before. Afghanistan is uh, the first nation, a lot of people don't know this, to recognize the USSR as a nation after the Russian Civil War. It's okay. a neighbor, and they've always had good relations or friendly relations, but they've also always went out of their way to become a neutral state. But as you people will see throughout history, neutral state means you play the game, you're leaning a little bit more towards one side. They were neutral, slightly leaning USSR. So mm -hmm. for the context that we were, we're looking at, Zahir Shah was the king of Afghanistan until 1973 when he was overthrown by his cousin, Muhammad Daud Khan. So... Mohammed Daud Khan was prime minister of Afghanistan in the 50s and the 60s and basically he had a western education so he's a bit more liberal minded so he passed a constitution to give women rights which wasn't always wow. the case in some of the Muslim countries back in those days mm -hmm. because and also I mentioned last time there was a very agrarian society that's true except that if you look at urban centers they were more progressive a little bit more you know up with the times cosmopolitan and stuff like that mm -hmm. so anyways his reforms could be seen as western liberal but he was also a very strong hard charging personality I and mean, he was a very i'm not gonna say self-important man but he was like somebody who knew he was capable but also really knew he was capable so mm -hmm. he wanted to be in charge of everything okay right? So, I guess he knew exactly what he wants to do. He knew the plans and... Yes, he had it in his head and he and wanted... Uh, by the way, uh, when maybe an interesting episode in the future. How could he have done such radical changes in a Muslim country? I don't know. Don't Maybe don't answer right away. Well, yeah, I mean, like, it's, I, it's, crazy, it's not... No? That's, that's a, that might be something interesting it's to look into for a future episode. Yeah, because he... A lot of it, I can tell you radical. right now, I, I haven't really looked into that ever, honestly. I wouldn't mind looking into it at all, but... Okay. Sorry I, to interrupt. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. But it's, it's, out, it's for fine. now, for our purposes now, I mm -hmm. could make an educated guess mm. based on everything I've read. It's basically knowing how to run the bureaucracy. It's how to... It was a relative of the king, quote, quote on family business, family operation. So it's not uh, about religion as right. much for him in that case. No, no, he realized it's that... More, for them, it's, it's more about keeping the bloodline there. and But about like, yeah, but he wanted to bring the country political forward. Political right. business kind of like mentality. But for him, it was also an ethnic thing. Because as I mentioned last time, Pashtuns are the majority in Afghanistan. They're about 40% of the population. And as I mentioned, they're a very diverse population. Okay. So there's 40%, 40 plus percent Pashtuns. Then there's Uzbeks and Tajiks. And those are like 20%, 15% each. Then there's all kinds of other ethnicities. Because it's a very, okay. it's a very radical thing. They all consider themselves Afghans, but it's a very diverse population. They have their own languages, their own cultures, etc. Mm -hmm. etc. But he was a Pashtun nationalist. So it's not like Muslim majority there. No, it's a Muslim it majority. Not, it's a Muslim majority. Uh, but they have a majority, but, but not by a big margin. No, by a big margin. Oh. It's a Muslim, Muslim, okay, Muslim okay. country. But they have Shia Muslims and they have Sunni Muslims, for mm -hmm. example. That's like, it's, uh, in our terms, like Catholic versus Protestant versus right. Orthodox, you know, like, they have okay. their own branches of it. An important part of this was that he had an idea of a Pashtunistan. So Pashtunistan, uh, his idea was that it was going to be a majority Pashtun rule. And to do that, though, he would have had to go into Pakistan and take some of their territory because the biggest minority in Pakistan is Pashtuns. Clearly, that didn't make the Pakistani government very happy, and that created a lot of tensions when he was prime minister, just the idea of it. 
Mm -hmm. So essentially, with all the pressures, and like you said, how did he manage to do this? Well, there was a lot of pushback. And mm -hmm. he was basically forced to resign. Oh, and okay. he gave so an he didn't manage, quote unquote. Well, he managed yeah. enough, but Explicitly. he didn't get. Yeah, but he didn't. Like, he wasn't like, able to get all the way there. Mm -hmm. The king, basically, his counter offer to the king is like, no, you basically make me ruler for ruler, ruler and decision maker over everyone. And the king said that's the opposite of what's going to happen. He basically had the tender resignation, and that didn't sit well with them. So you know, he spent his time being angry and organizing his next move. And his mm -hmm. next move happened to be, he had to get all the different coalitions in the country together. And do a revolution? Not exactly a revolution, a coup. In 1973, he overthrew... It's not the same? No, no, it's not. A revolution Don't has... Don't you a, need a coup to do a revolution? That nah, would be the question. No, no. You can do... Sometimes you need a revolution to do a coup. Sometimes mm. a coup can lead to a revolution, but they're not the same thing. A coup okay. is a change up in government. A revolution can succeed or it can fail. Ah, uh, whereas a coup does happen. Actually, I don't even know if that's accurate. But let's okay. put it this way. A revolution has a movement behind it. That's okay, that's okay. It has a philosophy. Yeah, I just like threw that on the side. Like, no, no, it's okay. It's, these are good questions to ask. It's interesting. Yeah. But so uh, to go back to... Daoud Khan, yeah. Daoud Khan, uh, yes. Yeah. Wow. Mohammed Trying to Khan. remember that name. You mean... Uh, Mohammed Daoud Khan. So anyways, yeah, no. Yeah. So what it is is that Daoud Khan uh, had to organize resistance and figure out how he was going to do this thing. He had to get the basically the consent or the approval of the communist party back then which was underground but it had enough support in the military ranks because back in those days you know every different country in the world communism was less rare than it is today and the afghani party was more or less underground and he had two main factions and i'm going to go into them right now very quickly because it's going to be very important later on uh, one of them was called the halk party and the other one was called the parcham party. Hulk? Hulk, like Hulk. <laughs> sounds like it, but no, it's Hulk. But yeah, think Hulk. Uh, Hulk is basically, I think if I'm not mistaken, it means the masses or people in Pashto. Sorry, Pashto. And Parcham means banner or flag. Now, Hulk was a more radical communist party. It's in revolution right away, Marxist change right away, power power to the workers right away, to the proletariat workers, mm -hmm. yada yada. Parcham was more of a, okay, they're acknowledged that Afghanistan isn't there yet in terms of a working class. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is that we need to get there first via maybe social democracy or something like that, develop the country, and then we'll go into Marxist things. And those became... Those two factions became very, very, very heated and angry at each other because they disagreed and also the personalities involved, as we'll get into, they were special people in a sense of ego and all those things. So they, there was a very strong split there. Mm -hmm. What happened was that the military had enough of the Parcham faction in it because Hulk was so radical that it was mostly driven underground that he needed their support to overthrow the king. So in 1973, it happened. It was a mostly bloodless... Mostly bloodless coup because uh, seven police officers in Kabul, the capital, didn't recognize that people were friendlies and they started shooting, so they died. And mm -hmm. another person died because of a chaotic order and he drove his tank into a river. Now, the problem with Daoud Khan is that a lot of the countryside, the very religious people in the countryside, mm -hmm. the uh, and it's very tribal, so a lot of the clan chiefs, okay, the mullahs and uh, the, the the very religious people, and that's the, the most of the country. They already saw him, even though he was more typically a liberal, they already saw him as pretty much Marxist, even though he wasn't that at all. I mean, he had some progressive ideas, but he was not a Marxist in any shape or form. Okay. But he had Marxist support. So they started getting very upset. He did figure out two things. Number one, his support of progressive social policy. More and more people in the countryside were getting uncomfortable and angry at that. And because of his support of Pashtunistan, the idea of that... The Pakistanis in, in, the, in him started having a very difficult relationship, up and down, up and down. And they remembered his idea of Pashtunistan, which he still didn't really want to back away from. Okay. So a lot of more radical Islamists started organizing violent movements. And in 1975, there was an uprising, a violent one, and people started more and more fleeing into Pakistan, which, where the government gave them bases, because... They don't want Pashtunistan. They don't want Afghanistan invading and uh, taking them. So they started a bit of a cold proxy war where spy versus spy. What do you mean they started accepting them? Because they just saying like basically, yeah. Come come, come here, come, come here and attack, attack Afghanistan from our territory. And this was going to be very important during the Soviet war. 
because that would have been the same dynamic. The Pashtunistan conflict is what basically laid the grounds for Pakistanis supporting radical Afghans of many different ethnicities and every different different beliefs or even characters, yada yada, we'll get to that in another okay, okay. episode. Yeah, 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 exactly. We'll but, to after. but that's that was okay, the beginning so of that. Maybe try to summarize so far. Here's what happens. So this is an overthrow basically where Afghanistan goes from being a kingdom, a monarchy, to a republic. Okay. But Dawud Khan might as well be a, be a king. Because he doesn't like input. Okay. He knows what he's doing. And he doesn't sure. trust the communists. So what does he do? So he purges the communists, the Parcham, which were the only wing of the, the uh, PDPA, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, the Communist Party. Right. He starts purging the communists from his government. The same communists who helped okay. get him into power. Right. So you can imagine that they're not very happy about that. Right. But he, but he also thinks he's safe to do this because the Khalq and Parcham wings of the Afghanistan and Communist Party are at each other's throats mm -hmm. all the time. Okay. So he thinks he's safe. Then he okay. goes to the Afghan Assembly in 1977 and he basically declares one party rule. And guess whose party? His party. So he might as well be king at this point. Okay, all right. Right, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, So, this all is right. it. So, it's basically, it's, it's, it's a... It's it, like a president applies for a presidential candidacy, then wins... And then there's uh, every there's four no more years there has to be a new election. But he says, that's it from now on. I don't, I remove in a, that rule in a modern no context, <laughs> in, in a modern context, yeah. But anyway, yes. No, no, but, but in a modern continue, context, sorry. think of Alexander okay. Lukashenko in Belarus. He wins by 95% every time. So let's go back, yes. Perfect. So, so we're Sour here. Revolution. Sour Revolution hasn't come yet. Not come but yet, it's, I but know. But it's in the air. But we've started off with the coup. Mm -hmm. Then we went on to a backfire where he goes against... I'm shortening, right? I'm yeah, yeah, no, no, because short. we have two backfires. He goes back to the against the Soviets, mm -hmm. and now we're at this point. He doesn't necessarily go against the Soviets. He goes against the communists. He goes the com against the communists in his own country. Against the communists. Ah, yes, in his own country. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and yes. he like always liked to play both the Americans and the Russians. There was a saying about him that he liked to smoke American light Amer sorry, that he liked to light American cigarettes with Soviet matches. Wow, that they, that's what, what a, they used to say about her. What a metaphor! That, that's a great metaphor. I know. I, 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 I will sorry, say it guys, again. Light American Soviet, American light American cigarettes with Soviet matches. With Soviet matches. I'm going wow. to in, now. He's going against the communists in his own country. in his own country. Next. And now what is the, it happens after this? So now, basically, what happens is that well, the the Soviets start getting a little antsy, but the Soviets are already you know they they're seeing an opening and they. Uh, but they're not sure. They don't want. To, they they really don't want to get it because it's a dangerous game to be playing internationally. This is not a Warsaw Pact nation, which was their military alliance, the Soviet military, which is like mm -hmm. their NATO. It wasn't that. You're you're meddling in a sovereign nation that is not aligned, technically speaking. What happens is, and the U.S. also starts taking an interest. Mm -hmm. They start saying, "Oh, is this guy amenable? Can we maybe play him against Pakistan?" You know, it's it's a uh, okay. geopolitics right. is a chess game. Yeah. Essentially, it's not that neither this nor that that happens. What happens is, in March of nineteen seventy, neither this nor that. Summarize. What's this that? Come no, on. neither uh, neither the move, neither the the Americans nor the the Soviets come in to take him. Okay. No, 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 no. It's the communists, the 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 <laughs> Afghan communists. Because there we go. because because karma. Yeah, karma's a karma's <laughs> a mofo. That's all I'm gonna say. Because there's a gentleman from the Par Parcham party who's a very well respected person, even across the aisle, quote unquote, in the Halk party. Mm -hmm. His name is, and I am going to massacre so many names, guys. That's I apologize fine. to anybody from Afghanistan. That's fine. Whatever you massacred, uh, let us know in the comments, and we're gonna put. We're a gonna caption. pronounce it, please. please we're gonna please. put it in text. I beg of you, correct me. I don't want to be. I've had my name massacred my whole life in the West. Yeah, actually, maybe it's a good time. Uh, to say that uh, anything Yuri says that you think is wrong put it in the comments and then we're gonna take a look at it if you're right we're gonna do a correction and we're gonna caption it the correction but otherwise do your own research as well don't just post what you think it is that being said in March of 1978 a gentleman that gentleman gets killed Mr. Khaybar he's a very well respected ideologue as in he is the guy behind the Parcham philosophy so, basically, he is assassinated outside of his home in March of 1978. Nobody still knows oh who did God. it. Oh, my God. They shot him, and he's dead. So, nobody to this day knows who did it. Mm -hmm. Everybody just has theories. Daoud Khan, the president... Because everybody could have a reason Everybody has a motive. Muhammad Daoud Khan, 
He's the prime suspect, and he's mm -hmm. the one who gets blamed. He blames Islamists for that mm -hmm. murder. Okay. The Islamists don't say a word about that murder. The communists blame each other for that murder. The communists blame him for mean? that murder. Ah, okay, the, got the, the it. Parcham, got it. Yeah, yeah. Some people in Parcham blame Khalq. Some people in Khalq blame Parcham. Some people in Parcham blame Daud Khan. Some people in Khalq blame Daud Khan. It's two fingers you know pointed in all directions at all times. It's a Mexican standoff yeah. of fingers. The consensus nowadays, the consensus I guess nowadays, from what I understand is that it was probably ordered by Daud Khan. But we still don't know. But anyways, what happened though is at the funeral, Daud Khan says something he did not expect to see. He saw Parcham and Khalq members united like he's never seen them before. Okay. 3,000 people showed up to that funeral. According to his own internal data, there were not even 3,000 communists in Afghanistan. But they were in, but they were at his funeral. And people from Parcham are speaking, and while they speak, people from Khalq are cheering them on. They came together, and that scared the living daylights out of them. Positive that they were so at each other's throats that they could never unite to take him on. But now he sees, oh no, they're united. This... If he's right, the one, if right, right, he's right. the one who ordered that assassination. Right. So what does he do? This backfired. Him. He starts arresting them the next day, April April twentieth. Oh, he God. starts. Uh, he puts out arrest warrants, um, but he doesn't have good intelligence. Some no. of them he arrests right away. Yeah, and then other other ones are are, are let go. Some he puts under house arrest because he doesn't know how dangerous they are. Yeah, that puts the communists into motion. They are now fighting for their lives because they're not just getting arrested. They're probably not going to live to see the next month. Right. They're not going to live to right, see right, May. Right. Yes. Okay? They, they realize that they don't have a choice. So one of those guys, and this is one from the so last on. episode. Let me let me summarize a little. So can I say the Saudi Revolution began April 19th? No, it became the week after. Okay. Uh-huh. Now of that. we're getting into the Saudi Got Revolution. It. Got it. It's Got called it. the Saudi Revolution because that's the Persian month when it happened. Saudi. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's in the Persian calendar. That's the mm -hmm. month. Anyways, within a week... The man from the last episode, Hafizullah Amin, he who was second in command of the Halk faction, he was put under house arrest and he started using his relatives as messengers to basically alert allies in the military that it's time. Because one thing that they didn't know is because when the Halk faction went underground after Daud Khan did the coup, well, Mr. Amin, who was a very good wheeler dealer and a very smart strategic man, was put in charge of recruiting military members of the Afghan army. They had the right people in the right place. Right. And that's how the Sour Revolution happened. He gave his, And this coup was not bloodless. This was a bloody coup. There was a lot of shooting. There was a lot of firing. Hundreds died. And so did Daoud Khan. Him and, his, him and almost his entire family were murdered. Wow. And they charged out of the presidential palace with their guns drawn. And they were killed right in front of the doorstep of the presidential palace. Well, and the army it. took over. And now the Sour Revolution was complete. And now the PDPA, the People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, came to be. Mm -hmm. and now we enter the calamity. So the Sour Revolution was at that moment. That's, when, That's it when it began. Right. And when did it end? How long did it last? It lasted a day and a half. Ah, uh, so it was purely that It moment. was a coup d'etat. Okay, guys, also, if uh, anything that I've said strikes you wrong, or if you know better, or if you have any corrections to make, put them in the comments, and we'll see if we can verify them. All right, everyone. See you in the next episode. Like, subscribe, share, etc. Please, all the good stuff. Thank you. Bye, guys. It was 10 days before the new president, Noor Mohammed Taraki, first appeared in public. Our relationship, you all should be attentively here our relationship with all the countries including Soviet Union and all our neighbors and throughout the world will be based and depend on the amount of their support to our revolutionary government in political economical field. Does this mean Mr. President that you will be following the strict policy of non-alignment? This is quite correct. He told the press that his government wasn't communist.